last talk of the session is by my colleague David Edgerson, who I discovered for the first time in a starting line to biologist. But uh, he is an engineering biologist from uh, Kiwa. Uh, David is, is going to take another view of uh, geotechnical data and how we are actually delivering it. Uh, we've already delivered uh, some of this, this approach in GIS. Yes, we have, yes. I shouldn't have titled this as you see it. I should have said Geotechnical GIS, How to Present Data, because that's what I'm going to talk about, data. I'd like to thank my co-workers and many others for making this possible. So the Geotechnical GIS I consider to be a desk study tool. That's all it is. It's just a tool to help people when they do a desk study for uh, engineering ground engineering purposes. It's uh, geological information, so that's our 3D model, which can be interpreted in any d number of different ways, but based on the litho lithostrate units, plus the geotechnical and geoenvironmental information and data. Now, in Glasgow, you've got a huge advantage because of Glasgow City Council's work in that the data that we deal with, which is now or could be available to, or will be available to our network, the geotechnical data, uh, making that available, there are problems of confidentiality. Now, our current understanding at the BGS is that the geotechnical data, not the boreholes, but the geotechnical data, is confidential unless, unless we've been told specifically not. Uh, in Glasgow, due to their hard work, I think 95% of the geotechnical data has been made freely available and so will be available to the US network and possibly beyond. Important confidentiality, we'll come back to it later. Right, here's a 3D model. This is the geological 3D model of central Glasgow. But it's slightly different uh, because I've classified each of the geological units uh, into engineering geological classes, very basic ones. So the blue units are mixed units, so they may be sand and gravel and clay, or they may be sand and gravel mixed in with clay, or they may be sand and gravel mixed in with clay plus sand and gravel. So, and also, the paler the color, the softer or weaker the material. So the darker, darker blues represents the wilderness till formation, which tends to be firm to stiff or very stiff, whereas the pale blue represents, the, uh, the, uh, represents um, very soft to uh, loose material. So then we come into the fines, fine materials, which are in here, the brown, so that's silts, essentially silts and clays. Again, the paler the color, very soft to firm. These tend to be laminated as well. And the, f the, f the darker color is firm to, firm to stiff. And then we come to the yellow and orange colors, coarse. Uh, so the pale color is loose to medium dense and the darker color is medium to very dense. So for, engineering, so for the quaternary, we've got a very simple classification, but we can use that in many ways. But so that's our geological information. Now we come on to data, geotechnical data. Site investigations these days produce huge varieties of different data, uh, different classifications of data. And this is a simple representation of the National Geotechnical Properties Database, um, called by uh, an ex uh, engineering geologist, the leading engineering geologist, Martin Colshaw. He's still alive, he just doesn't work for the BGS anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not exiting that way, but you know something. So, and th this, these, this geotechnical database is based on the AGS, Association of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Specialists, that's been mentioned earlier. Um, this is version 3.1. There's a new version 4, which is more complicated. Um, we haven't got that far yet, but in the future we probably will have to. So we have project in the far over here. Don't touch too hard. No. The far over there, we have project information, whole information or location information. Then we have all the ensued testing. Then we have the samples from the uh, boreholes or from the pits or from surface and then we have all the oh no we'll come back to that in a minute then we have all the laboratory data now the circles are the bits that the BGS puts a bit more information into because we are geologists we put in the geological units um, particularly now because the names have changed 
um, to improve understanding. And also the chemistry, in geoenvironmental chemistry, anybody who works in that sort of area knows that you get a huge variety of data of all the different ions, cations, and the um, organics. Uh, we don't actually put those in by hand uh, from paper or PDFs because that would take forever, but we will add them if we've got AGS data. That's what the database looks like, and if you'd like to discuss it with that later, I'm, I'd be quite happy to. So it's quite complicated, but it works quite well. So all the geotechnical data that the BGS has added to a database is in this database, and hopefully the stuff that is provided by Glasgow will also end up in this database. Well, it will do. So we've added a lot of data from the old days, from paper and, and PDF, um, and more recently, AGS data, uh, digital data transfer format, which saves weeks, possibly months, on adding a large site investigation, certainly weeks. And it's quite wonderful. That's our current holdings. They're mostly based on our projects that we've been doing. So there's quite a nice number around London. There's a nice number around Glasgow and various other cities. Other ones have been added, particularly the Highways Agency in England and Wales has provided data through their data portal. So we just add the AGS data from that data portal to our database. So we've got about 100,000 boreholes in there. But 40, over 40% 40 now are AGS digital data format, which certainly speeds everything up, and we've got about 2.7 million datas. And in central Glasgow, we've got about 5,500 boreholes and pits. Right. I want to make that data more easily available and, and use different methods of graphing to enable an understanding of the variability of the different geological units, because we're geologists. We may have a different thing in our former life, but we are now geologists. And so we, we, we use the geological units as the basis of a lot of, our, a lot of the work. So this is a, the idea of this is not area-specific. Area it's not project-specific or use-specific. So we may want to build the foundations. We may want to tunnel. So that you would, if you were doing that separate item, you would interpret them separately. You'd have a different system. But we're just providing data and information. We, the, we need to present, well, I've presented data and summary data, and also actually as the data itself, as you will see. So the GIS contains basic information. We've seen this before, so that's just the geology, the solid geology, or bedrock geology. Then we have the superficials. We also added the data it's grids from the 3D geological model that's been provided. So we have, as we have elsewhere, say in Rotterdam and other places, we have thickness, depth to top, depth to base from surface or OD. And so because they're grids, you can, you can interrogate each, each part of the map to find out the thickness, depths, etc., of all the different units if they're switched on. And this is anthropogenic, the anthropogenic unit thickness map. We can also put in hazard information. Uh, you could put landslides in if you're in that sort of area, or uh, shrink swell problems if you're that sort of area. But Glasgow, it's mining. So this is the, from the work from the 1980s that uh, Alison's already mentioned. So here we've added the worked uh, seams, or different seams, or worked materials within 35 meters of rockhead, which were considered to be the main hazard or risk in the area. We also need to know, if you've got the geotechnical information, we need to know where the data is. As has already been mentioned by Andy, um, it's clustered or in linear, because that's the way we do our site investigations. We build roads, or we build houses, or large buildings, so it's clustered or along linear, linear uh, routes. We also need to know how deep that information is, how, how, how deep the boreholes were, because that gives an idea of how many things we go through and the likelihood of hitting the rock underneath. So that's also in the GIS. Yeah, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Right. We have a number of tools that have been specially written for this GIS. And this is to enable us to look at the plots that have already been drawn to give us an idea of variation. 
and also looking at the data itself. So here's an example, Paisley Clay member, uh, I, we've got Atterberg um, plot, plasticity plot, and that is the plot of the Paisley Clay member, and that would come up in your GIS very simply. We have lots of other plots, I think there's 54 in all, I got a bit carried away. Um, and this is an example of a box and whisker plot showing uniaxial compressive strength for the different units. Um, so you can get very quickly see from this that, that some units are weaker than others. Um, the upper model, the upper curl measures tends to be weaker than the middle curl measures. The, um, that's the WVAS is um, the um, igneous intrusive, the sills, and they tend to be stronger than the, the other rocks as well. So very quickly get an assessment of the different rocks. One? Okay. And here's an example of a plot that um, it's using the descriptive stuff we have in the boreholes. So you often have materials that are described as from weak, in rocks, from very weak to extremely strong. You won't get that information from um, laboratory tests. The reason is that often the weak stuff, you don't get out the borehole and you can't test it. So this is a way, again, of visualizing, very simple way, the differences in rock strength between the different units modeled within the area. We also have cross sections, and this is a rather a complex cross section in which we have a map showing the cross section, we have lithostratigraphy in the background, we have lithology in the, uh, well, which way are we? Left hand borehole, and then we have a characteristic, in this case, a described strength or density in the right hand borehole. So you can click on this and then you can blow it up and have a look at it in detail within the GIS. We also can look at data on the fly. This is the real data, the data from a little database which is contained within the GIS. So we can select a table, and this we're looking at rock testing, it's in rock strength. We select a formation, we say what, what uh, type of uh, unit, the parameter we want to look at and how we want to look at it. And here is an example. The black dots are sandstone, this is with depth, stronger in this direction. The uh, green is mudstones, as you see, there's very few mudstone tests. That's because you can't, it's very difficult to make a sample to test in the laboratory. And the uh, purple are siltstone, so you can have a, an idea of, so is there any relationship between depth and strength? Nah, of course not. Within the GIS, then, we can, within that parameter, we can then go back to the map the graph and select part of the graph and find out where those points are, or we can go back to the map and we can select an area within that map to see what the data is in, in that area. And so here we have the data for that area. Unfortunately, it changes the colors of each of the points, which is slightly frustrating. Um, so the purple points are now sandstone, the black ones mudstone, and the green ones are siltstone. So in this, and then each of those points you can interrogate with the information that's within the table. Now, we have the AST network, so we have Glasgow City Council working with British Geological Survey, we have databases, we have data managers, and we have the geology, the 3D models, and now the GIS. And that's fed back into the clients, consultants, contractors, and site investigation comes back to BGS, the validated AGS format, as we've already heard. Now, and that's the AST network currently. Now, I'd like to make sure the data goes out, of course, from the center, not just geological, all the geotechnical data, data should be made available to the AST network, and perhaps even beyond. Permissions and, uh, from clients is, has always been a problem. Um, within the AST network, hopefully, that's not the case. Um, however, what I would like to see is, is taking this approach of, a, of allowing data out to be not local, regional, as in Glasgow, but also national. And that should not really be a problem for all publicly funded work, because I consider that data should be available to third parties for desk study. Right, I'll finish there. I could go on. Do you want lunch? <laughs> there we are. Any questions from the audience? Everybody wants lunch, don't they? See it in their eyes. Ah. Alan McDonald. Yeah. Alan. It's shown as a good example of uh, uh, using the, the data to provide kind of statistical summaries for different literal strat units, as opposed to more conventional way to do it. And then 
Catholic Kingdom 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 Catholic Kingdom